is Alex, and this is a conversation series for the Council of Christians and Jews. Um, I, we've got two guests with us today, I'll introduce them in a moment. Let me begin by first saying that we're meeting here in Melbourne on the land of the Kulin Nations, and I want to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And before we begin, um, we're, this, this topic in particular is about abuse and advocacy. Um, so I just want a, a trigger warning, some of the things we, we may be talking about today could be for confronting, so I just want to raise that at the beginning. So our two guests are uh, Diane McDonald, welcome, uh, and Annie Wax. Um, so just um, for context, I'm not going to introduce you, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Just for context, maybe tell a little bit about what happened to you, your story, and, um, and we'll start with that. So Diane, you can go first. My name is Diane McDonald, um, for about five years I had relentless stalker. Now this is someone that I was not in a domestic relationship with. I only dated. He never stayed overnight in my home, none of none of that. But his obsession with me was to the point of yeah, it was very, very dangerous. Um, you can watch my story, my Australian story, but uh, it took three years to get police help. It then took another two years to have him incarcerated. So once you, you go through everything that the person does to you, you then have a lot of court appearances and adjournments and everything takes so much time. Seven years down the track now, I'm still dealing with things with him and a crisis point will be January of 23 for me when the corrections order runs out. He is released now, but he's under a corrections order. Thank you very much and thank you for sharing. Um, and Manny as well, just a little bit about what happened to you and just for our context. Sure, Manny works. Um, I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox environment uh, here in Melbourne in the, Jewish, in the Jewish community, of course, and uh, was sexually abused by two perpetrators within our community. And uh, one of them has been held to account uh, through the court system where he's been jailed, released, re, re arrested in relation to many other allegations. Um, and uh, I'm still hoping that my uh, first perpetrator uh, will be held to account at some point. But importantly, it's not, my story is not only about the abuse itself, it's also about the cover ups of the, by the institution, the Yeshiva Center. And when I did speak out in 2011 and shared my story, um, for the sake of getting justice and to try to prevent these types of issues from recurring. Uh, I was also um, enduring me and my family uh, an intimidation campaign essentially by that leadership uh, at the Yeshiva Centre. Um, um, thank you again. Thank you for sharing your story as well. Did, did, did you have intimidation as well, Donna? Yes, yeah. Manipulation, you intimidation. If, uh, as much as you want to share about that. It's pretty much coercive control. That's that's what was used against me. So it was all of that intimidation, manipulation, um, financial abuse. Um, yeah, the list was endless, and, and it takes a toll on you mentally. Mm. Who was actually? Could I ask who was actually perpetrating the intimidation? His name is Max Gardner. Oh, his name I, I can say it. his name is out there. Mm. Yeah, and we've had court approval to say his name. Mm. Yeah, along the way. Um, so again, I, I want you to be comfortable and only share what you want to share. Um, I want to get, what I really want to talk about and what this session is really about is what we can learn from your experiences and what I know many in particular you've been a strong advocate. Maybe tell us a little bit about some of your advocacy work here and abroad and then what do you think we as communities can learn from some of the things that happen to you? Well, my uh, abuse happened within the context of a religious environment and I think um, to me what I've seen and certainly growing up in that environment and subsequently became even clearer is the level of respect and much more than that, um, adoration and all that to, towards the um, adoration towards the, the, the rabbis and the uh, men of clergy in the Orthodox community, it is only men in the Jewish community. Uh, so I think one of the issues that I've been raising is that uh, there needs to be a better understanding around the role of a rabbi in our case, the role of the clergy and religious leadership, uh, the importance of uh, robust governance 
transparency, accountability, all of those types of things. And what I've seen, and again, I can only talk about my experience um, and in my in the Jewish communities around the world, not just in the issue center where the abuse happened in my case, right around the world, uh, often the more closed, the more orthodox, the more extreme the community is, the greater the vulnerabilities often tend to be. Uh, because often the community members uh, go to the rabbi to ask every question, whether it's they can go to work, whether they should be studying Bible all day, whether they should marry off their child, who with, and every aspect of their daily life. And that's okay if that's how they want to lead their life, it's their choice. But they also have to take responsibility um, to address these issues because we've seen countless cases across the world where initially the abuse happens because of lack of education, lack of understanding around these issues, mm -hmm. not wanting to talk about the words sex and, and being very careful around that. And I understand, again, we need to understand and respect people's choices in how um, they educate their children and how they raise their children, especially in this crazy world of ours. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be at the cost of um, increasing the vulnerability of children. And therefore, uh, what we've seen over and over again, it does not always um, uh, it, it benefit the children if we leave it in the hands of the community leadership. Sometimes it does need to be an external um, uh, uh, organisation, often more often than not, government organisation to come in and to address these things through policies, through legislation and the like. So that is probably, the, those are the key messages mm -hmm. around what we as religious communities need to do to address these issues and ensure proper governance in place, sure, keep your cultural practices, your religious practices, no one's trying to come and impose that yeah. level of contradiction. Yeah, We're trying to protect the children and to hold yeah. others to account. And by the law as well. Exactly, absolutely. Right. And I know your, your abuse wasn't within a religious context, I don't think you're connected necessarily to a religious community, but based on the things you've heard, is there anything you'd like to add? It's exactly correct. You said you need government to be involved. I've been advocating for that and have been <coughs> this made, making some inroads in that regard because stalking was basically an unheard of crime, especially if out of a domestic violence situation. So when you go for compensation and things like that, stalking, I, I was told to come back when I had a case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet he was going after my my parents, my best friend, my daughter's boyfriend's parents. Mm -hmm. You know, I had all these people on my intervention order, and once you get an intervention order, you're then under the domestic violence banner. Mm -hmm. But I didn't fit into that. Mm -hmm. So I've had to raise awareness, and coercive control is my thing that I'm really advocating for here in Victoria. Yeah, it's not even on, on the table. And I'm sure with like sexual abuse and everything like that, there's that coercive control, that subliminal control, because you're too scared to say anything. You don't have your voice. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I felt. I yeah. had no voice. No one believed me, mm -hmm. even when I was... Experiencing what you were yeah. experiencing. And especially when in your case you were a child, so probably yes. even more so people didn't believe Less of a voice. Absolutely. And, and I think... Um, the other the issue that, that I'm thinking about that um, is also relevant specifically to religious communities mm -hmm. um, is that often people in the, the co-religionists, those who go to synagogue or to church together, mm -hmm. um, they end up, it's a community and I can, you know, no one will argue about the issue of child sexual abuse or at least not right-minded people, mm -hmm. everyone will say that's just unacceptable, etc. Mm -hmm. In Dice case, for example, the stalking issues Firstly, people take that less seriously, as yeah, you yes. pointed out. Yes. But even more so within a close community where where people know each other, the conflicts of interest in these types of communities mm -hmm. are so prevalent mm -hmm. that holding someone to account or dealing with it appropriately is often neglected. It's, mm -hmm. it's ignored for all sorts of reasons, whether it's they don't believe the person or they don't want to cause friction and uh, you know, mm -hmm. unsettlement in the, in the community. Yeah, it might just go away if Absolutely. they ignore it long enough. Mm -hmm. Just look at stuff out.
So on that note, Manny, I know you've done a lot of advocacy. Can you tell us about some of the advocacy you've done internationally as well to bring this issue to greater prominence? Sure. I mean, firstly, the most obvious one is through here in Australia, through the Royal Commission, mm -hmm. the public hearings and, and um, the public awareness that we've raised around this issue. Including within uh, the Jewish community. Including um, specifically, I guess, within the Jewish community, but certainly a lot of our work has gone beyond that. Uh, I can tell you, I remember when uh, the Royal Commission public hearings were taking place, including in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in, in Israel, where I still live uh, now, mm -hmm. and uh, I flew over to Rome uh, to stand in support mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. some of those. Mm -hmm. George Pellback. Well, it was even before that as well. There was a public hearing going on there, and um, some of the uh, victims from the survivors from uh, Ballarat oh, yes. um, went down there, mm -hmm. and, um, and I know some of some of them. Mm -hmm. I knew them beforehand, and um, certainly um, Anthony. Chrissy Foster were there mm -hmm. as well, um, mm -hmm. and the late Anthony, which is um, very sad, but I went there to stand in support of them uh, as well, because I think we do need to support each other, mm -hmm. and we need to highlight uh, these issues that occur in every segment of society, mm -hmm. but we need to also acknowledge that, particularly within religious groups, some of these issues are more complicated and therefore need to be addressed separately. Mm -hmm. But some of the other advocacy work, I mean, I was involved uh, in the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse by the UK government. Mm -hmm. I was involved also in the Child Victims Act, the change in New York. I mean, it's astonishing that if someone was sexually abused uh, up until the age of 18, they used to have five years until the age of 23 to uh, press charges with criminal offences or civil offences. The Child Victims Act uh, in New York changed it and provided more time um, for both of those cases. Extending the statute of limitations. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of, of, of specific um, advocacy mm -hmm. uh, roles that are played, but obviously also through public awareness um, conferences we've held mm -hmm. to try to focus on educating, in particular, uh, the institutions, parents, and most importantly, the community. Mm -hmm. Because this is an all community approach. You cannot have just the leadership involved in focusing on the institutions or just the parents and certainly not just the children, which we see sometimes um, there's, a, there's a concept of empowering children. Now, that is very important mm -hmm. to empower children and provide them tools, etc. But ultimately, the buck stops with us as adults, as parents, as those who are responsible mm -hmm. for the welfare of the most vulnerable in our community. Absolutely, and um, I, do you want to talk a little bit about some, about some of your advocacy as well? Yeah, so I've um, it's been a ref stalking reform, so I submitted nearly a 9,000 word submission mm -hmm. with basically what happened to me and how they can rectify it and what a victim actually needs when they first go looking for help. Mm -hmm. So that's been tabled and also they've done an inquiry into crime, into the justice system and everything like that. So I have a lot of input in with police mm. and how police actually treat a victim. But it does take a lot to go in and to, because I know I kept everything very secret for a very long time. I'm sure um, most victims do. Because, you know, people would be like, oh no, that can't be happening, that, that's too outrageous, mm. you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it actually was. Mm -hmm. And until you find your voice and your strength to really push the, the subject matter of what's happening to you, yeah, you do kind of hold back. Mm -hmm. So that's all in the um, crime in justice inquiry. So mm -hmm. that's been tabled as well. So I'm really hopeful with that. There's been um, a trial of a new tool that they've gotten from overseas called the SASH tool. And it gives police a little bit extra scope mm -hmm. when talking to perpetrators or even talking to victims, just so they can then work out who is actually telling the truth here, because it comes down to your word against theirs. Mm -hmm. And police have to then be mindful that they're not accusing the wrong person. Uh, I think you touched on a very important point mm -hmm. that I've seen happen all too common, uh, the lack of police um, training or professionalism in dealing with certain crimes and mm -hmm. certain circumstances. Um, it's important because, especially in the context of child sexual abuse, 
um, it takes decades often, um, and we saw that in the Royal Commission, decades for a victim survivor to disclose it to anyone. And imagine the circumstance where they finally gather the strength, the courage to go to a police station to provide a police statement, and then they are treated in a way that makes them feel... Pre-victimised. Pre-victimised, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very important issue. You, you did disclose those when you were a child initially, didn't you? I disclosed mine, uh, well, initially to a friend mm -hmm. when I was about um, 12 years old, mm -hmm. and then as a result of that, he went and shared it with, um, with schoolmates. And the only reason I found out about that is because um, when I used to go back to school after that, I was being called a poof down mm -hmm. and all those kind of words. So that was really horrific. But then in 1996, when I was 20 years old, I went to the police, gave a police statement, mm -hmm. and they said they weren't going to close the case, but they were going to leave it open pending further information. Mm -hmm. So there was lack of evidence at the time. And then because of the 2011 public disclosure that I made uh, in the media, mm -hmm. more uh, victims came forward to the sure. police. And as a result of that, um, we are where we are today. Absolutely. So on that note, and just to finish off, so one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this in the context of the Council of Christians and Jews is exactly to your point that this happens in all communities. Um, uh, Christians, Jews, and anyone, atheist, any community, um, as, as, as an advocate says, sexual abuse or, or, or a, a domestic abuse doesn't discriminate. Exactly. Um, um, and so on that point, just to finish off, just some final thoughts of where you want to see maybe advocacy go and what you're hoping to achieve by some of the advocacy work that you're doing. Maybe start with your time. Um, yeah, like I said, I've been advocating now for coercive control, so that's really on my agenda to, for victims to go in and be believed that all these things are happening to them. Um, laws to be changed. Yeah. I think that We've seen significant changes in the last couple of decades, mm -hmm. and particularly in the last decade, in terms of uh, us as a society, mm -hmm. uh, where we were to how we are feeling today. You, you cannot uh, compare... Almost well, as a season of reckoning at the moment. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we still have a very long way to go. And the best evidence for that, if you just look around at the cases that are still happening today, mm -hmm. um, and whether it's at the uh, information of abuse, allegations of abuse surfacing, and we've seen that mm -hmm. in the Jewish community recently in the last, um, uh, in the last year, and I think our organisation, Voice CSA, mm -hmm. is dealing with many such cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also see it in the context of how institutions are faring and how they're behaving. And we mm -hmm. just had um, what's happened in Yeshiva College in Sydney, mm -hmm. despite the fact mm -hmm. that it was um, it went through the Royal Commission as well. Yeah. It is now about to be, it's been deregistered mm -hmm. um, and the for non compliance for non-compliance of governance issues. And it, it, it was basically, it is an unsafe environment mm -hmm. and we still have these cases happening. So a lot more needs to be done, especially in the uh, more religious, closed communities, mm -hmm. because their starting point was a lot uh, was a lot further behind yeah. than the rest of society for a whole host of reasons. Yeah. So we still have a long way to go. I'm, I'm happy we are where we are today compared to the past, mm -hmm. but it, it really does um, not only just disappoint me. I mean, I, I, I see it on, 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 a, on a daily basis practically mm -hmm. in terms of the effect and the impact that we, that so many people are still suffering, families, victims, and therefore we still need to try and improve. Right, and your organisation and many others are doing that. And, and I don't think just adv off. advocacy, you know, it takes a really strong person to stand up and repeatedly say, this is mm. what we need, this is what we need. But if we don't, it's not going to stop. Mm. Yeah, and then more and more and more victims will be affected. So that's why, you know, I put my hand up. There were five, six other victims from mm. the same perpetrator before mm. me. Mm. They are still too traumatised mm. to come forward and it also affected their children, mm -hmm. one of which is now living in London to escape everything from here. Mm -hmm. He terrorised them not only in Victoria, but followed them to Queensland. Mm -hmm. So she's now in London, but she has major psychological problems now. Mm -hmm. So I think by people, strong people, and you do find your strength mm -hmm. to use your voice, approach governments, just so the victims of the future they don't go through the, the hell that we have been through to get our voices heard. It's already there. It's, it's already a precedent set. So it hopefully be a little bit easier for any of the victims. So thank you to both of you for your strength, for your continued advocacy, for sharing your story and for being so open. 
Um, and again, if anyone has any issues, um, please contact the appropriate authorities. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.